Yeah. Well, actually, I should have restarted my first lecture <laughs> with this, but <laughs> since every time I say next time, but in the end, I keep forgetting. So this time, I said I will do it in the beginning, but I'm sure in the end, I will forget it, you know. And that's... Uh, yeah. 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 You know, there's 12, you know. I don't... I cannot oh, listen. Okay. I cannot pull 12, you know, so maybe I will uh, mention it when I reach the point. <coughs> So actually, most of the material I talked about can be found actually in these references, especially in the first and the last. And for the classification of finite spaces, it's this paper by the standard model, which is mathematical. There is a physical review version of it, which is not mathematical, where things are summarized. It's called uh, conceptual ex explanation. I think physical review letters force us to change the, the title, you know. I think it was called uh, "Dress for the Beggar," and didn't like uh, didn't like this terminology. So, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> okay. So today, the last uh, of my lectures, uh, I will uh, I'll start quickly by um, summarizing what we have done since it was a break of two weeks. So. Uh, our basic assumption is that space-time is the product of a continuous space times, or a semi-direct product, times a fixed finite space. And um, this should be taken as a basis for unification. In other words, this has to be considered as geometric space. And all geometrical entities built on this space should be used in constructing the action. And uh, since it's at non commutative geometry, it means uh, there is a lot of information actually in both the algebra and, well, in the three algebra, Hilbert space, and Dirac operator. And uh, the Dirac operator one has to study the spectrum. And the eigenvalues of the spectrum are the geometric invariants. So we really have applied this idea to the product space of the four dimensional continuous manifold times a finite space. Now, which finite space we used? We use a finite space. We classify first, actually. We have classified finite spaces subject to what we call weak physical requirements. And we ended up that the space is C plus H, let me say left, plus M3 of C. And I remind you, actually, that originally, this was really due to the neutrino mixing. Was really see these three come together in one algebra, and this is on the other. And um, what really breaks the symmetry is the mixing between fermions and their conjugates. And this implies the existence of a Majorana mass to only one particle. Which has to be neutral. And it's no coincidence that this happened to be the right hand in neutrino. What we have shown also is that the basic building blocks, block, uh, basic building uh, operator, is not only the D, but the D that includes fluctuation, which we labeled by DA. And this DA is equal to D, where D is, you know, it could be a Dirac operator, say, in a trivial Dirac operator that doesn't mix anybody in flat space, plus flat, non commuted space, I would say, plus some connection supplemented by this term, where we have a, where actually A is a connection, and there is a universal formula for it. And the AI 
and the bi are element of the algebra. <coughs> so this actually gives all connections. And then we have shown that the connection A contains Let me say the following, you know. So let me give you a drawing just to. So let me assume this is h right, h left. And then this here, m4 of c. And this, we said, essentially is broken into same term, terms of the form lambda lambda bar. And then here, let me say it is uh, Catonian q. And here I have, you know, same lambda. And here I have three by three meters. So these are the elements of the algebra. A tree takes this form. And then what we have seen is that the connection A, in this case, according to the same terminology, would really have this form, which I'm really going to. So for this part, it will have a zero. And then it will have b mu. And here it will have you know, some b mu with some power and some su2. Let me call it w. And in the lower part, what it will have, it will have you know, b, w, and v for quarks. It will have everybody. And here, actually, there's a b because it's broken. Now, what happened actually is really along the off-diagonal elements, we really get the Higgs field. And here, what we really get, but something that connects actually here, the h right with the h left. And this happens to be the Higgs and you know h dual, whereas this is defined to be sigma 2 h star. In other words, actually, we really have one Higgs field, which would give math mass to both uh, lep, you know, the, say, electron and the neutrino, and the up and the down quark. And it's known, actually, that in the standard model, the Higgs field is not the Higgs field that gives mass to the up and down quarks is the same Higgs field. There are no different Higgs fields. And this actually, you know, yeah, but the question is that there is no here. The two things that they are really independent of each other. Actually, uh, they are dependent on each other. They could have they could have been independent of each other, but they are really dependent on each other, which shows actually that only this is the consequence that only one Higgs field is present. Now, for the Dirac operator, we have seen actually that there is here. Well, there is zero here. Zeros everywhere, actually. There's only a singlet entry. Sigma is a singlet that gives Majorana mass to right handed neutrino. So, this is really actually are all consequences of the construction. They are, I would say, predictions of the construction that a singlet would exist, and the singlet is extremely necessary. It plays a fundamental role in giving the Majorana mass to the neutrino, the right hand neutrinos. In addition, so it, it really can establish the CISO mechanism. In addition, it was in our paper in the. In the yeah, it's, it's this actually. It's, yeah, 2010, so it was published already before Higgs was discovered. And um, the reason we mentioned that is that it really has a big, big uh, consequence on the stability of the Higgs doublet or the Higgs field in the potential, it shows that you really can extend, one can extend the standard model all the way one extend, one can extend. All the way up. To very high energies beyond the 10 to the 11 GeV, 
where the Higgs coupling lambda quartic coupling becomes negative. I mean, without this field, it would become negative. But yeah. it, stay, it so stays positive because of this field. So that's a very, very important point. In the sense, you know, that many people think that our model is ruled out because of the low Higgs mass, which is 125 yeah. TeV. But in fact, because we had this field, if we had computed the renormalization group equations and so on, we would have found that it, it, was, it was perfect. Mm -hmm. One can show, actually, from the stability argument, that if you don't have the sigma, then there's a prediction that the mass of the Higgs is somewhere between 160 and 180 GV. And this was the first thing ruled out. You know, This is ruled out. It was ruled out first, before the Higgs was discovered at 126. However, once we have this, you know, there is no problem because it makes everything stable. And this argument of stability, which was used in getting this mass, uh, not only actually in our case, it's not only stability, we have some mass relation which forces, which forces this prediction to be in this range. Anyway, so now everything is okay because the sigma is necessary and it's really necessary because one really has to break the M4 of C into C plus M3 of C that this is really necessary and the symmetry is broken. Uh, I can, so essentially, I really can summarize for you actually what are the uh, positive or the uh, predictions of the model. I can, I can, before, before going on, is that, uh, so let me repeat actually, what did we assume and what did we get? What we put in and what did we get out? What we put in is that, this is our assumptions. assumptions uh, that space-time is a product of a continuous four-dimensional space or manifold, let me say, times a finite space. So this is an assumption. The second assumption while we were doing the classification we did is that one of the algebras and for C is subject to a symplectic symmetry reducing it M2 of H. So that actually limits two cationions. Uh, three, we did assume that D of that day is different than zero. And four, we did assume at some point that the neutral algebra U of A the, for the whole thing is restricted to S2 of A. Actually, this condition somehow implies anomaly cancellation. But as you see, one has to assume, one has to put some input, and this is the input we put. Okay, one can argue actually why you have to put this input, are there way out mathematically, but you know, it's not easy. We did try, and it was not really e easy to reduce this yeah, set. For the force condition, yes, it's, it's possible. For the force condition, it just comes from the fact that in M4 of C, you only look at the automorphism, so it, it wipes out this set. Um, for the force condition. For the whole thing? No, no, for the, yeah, for the whole thing, exactly. For the whole, for the whole thing. thing. And then, okay, then when you reduce, you, you get this condition. So yeah. now this is, this is really understood. Okay. So maybe this can be weakened, actually. This can be weakened, yeah. Okay, predictions. First, the number of Fundamental fermions 
per family is 16. The algebra is C plus H plus M theory of C. This comes out actually as a consequence of the assumptions. And we obtain the correct representations of the fermions, mean the 16, with respect to SU3 cross SU2 cross 2. This is not trivial, actually, to get exactly, especially the ion hypercharges, really very difficult to get. But really, to get the 3, 2, 1 for each one of them really comes out. The fourth is that we predict the existence of a Higgs doublet. And the phenomena of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And the V minus, uh, the v minus but that actually really comes comes from <laughs> is a consequence of having the correct hypercharges. Is a consequence actually, and you know especially with the negative with the negative mass term for the Higgs, which is minus whatever B squared H by H. So it comes with that. Uh, a prediction, more or less, actually, of the top quark mass of top quark, compatible with the experiment. You know, we'll get it within, say, 4% or something. I would say, actually, why you know, we were not able to pinpoint everything to the last uh, digit. We also predicted the seesaw mechanism. To give very light left-handed neutrinos. And I will add, actually, something I mentioned last time at the end of the lecture, is that you get the correct Gibbons Hawking term Hawking, yeah. Uh, in addition to the to the Hilbert Einstein action. Einstein Hilbert action. Mm -hmm. Which is that, uh, you know, uh, when people talk about the minimal, minimally coupled standard model with gravity, they take the sum of the two terms. But we do get a cross term, which is, uh, which is in fact, uh, also predicted by Feynman, which is the term is in Rh square. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not really the sum of the gravity plus the standard. Conformal couplings of scalars to gravity. In the right ah, so you get terms like root G D for X R H bar H term. Also R sigma squared terms. You know. These terms are are really present, you know. Um, they are there with the conformal value, you mean? Yeah. It's yeah. This um, you know, this is a thing which is like a theorem actually. Is that in the spectral action You get actually first is cosmological term, which is lambda. Then you get uh, Einstein term, let me write it, cosmological, Einstein Hilbert term, which is root gr. And also you get actually h bar h term and sigma squared term. Then the next term in this expansion, in this asymptotic expansion, you get really what I call a conformally invariant action, which is root gr. And then you get actually all the uh, 
d mu h squared, you get f mu nu squared, and you get r h bar h. And it's not r h bar. No, no, this is a, you know, a formal, yeah. Yeah, C, C mu and euro sigma squared, yeah, right, okay. Plus, and it's, it comes with the, with the vial tensor squared. And there is, of, of course, actually another term, which is uh, gauss bonnet is also there. So this is really conformal. So what does it mean, actually, if one really assumes that this is an effective action from the Wilsonian point of view, it means your starting point is conformally invariant, at least for the uh, for all terms with which are uh, have dimensionless coupling. All these terms as known really have dimensionless coupling, and uh, so of course the coefficient is logarithmic, and um, that's why it comes. It's exactly actually conformal, every single term. So these are actually I, I can say these are the main. You know, they are uh, more subtle points, but I will not go through the more subtle points. Um, I can explain actually why the thing, uh, okay, what are the drawbacks? So maybe actually one has also to, to say a few things which, no, no, only the one, one term in the expansion is conformal. Yeah, this, the whole block actually is conformal. All quartic let me see, order four, are really conformal. It comes exactly conformal. Again, they are really conformal. Yeah, but the, the meaning of the conformal R H square is only with respect to the first line. It's conformal means I change. Yeah, yeah. No, this actually, of course, these two terms destroy conformal invariance. The cosmological and the, they. If I change R here. Yeah. G, the metric, by something proportional to one plus H square, okay? Yeah. I, I, I will change the coefficient of R H square. So what is the meaning? If I have something non conformal you said the coefficient was one six, which is the conformal. Right. Yeah. Is it one six? Well, yeah. yeah. One, but one, one six mm -hmm. means that when I change uh, yeah. the metric by a conformal thing, uh, I can absorb completely this R H square in, uh, in the metric. No? It means I can make disappear. Uh, not, no, well, actually, like, okay. Uh, this, no, 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 uh, this, I say only one part in this expansion happens to be conformally invariant. One can prove, actually, why this term in the asymptotic heat kernel expansion is conformal, actually. Let me say something, actually. See, last time I did say that the gibbons Hawking term comes exactly with the right sign coefficient. However, as you know, I also added that if I use not the Dirac operator but Laplacian, you get the wrong coefficient. In the same story, actually, suppose that I didn't use d squared in my expansion. I say f of Laplacian or something. Then, of course, this term, this part of the expansion, will not be conformal. It has to do with the Dirac operator. Yes, the Dirac operator has more conformal properties than Laplacian. Yes. No, but you have to change the h, of course. No, no, actually, I, you know, I will, I, will come, I will come to the question of scales, actually. What does it mean to have this conformal invariance? I'm coming, I'm coming to it. But that's the reason, actually, I didn't want to stress so much that I have this RH bar, because you're right, you know, the, either the whole action is conformally invariant or it's not conformally invariant. I would say the whole action is not conformally invariant, because when I go even to even higher orders in my expansion, this conformal invariance breaks down, you know? It's, uh, the part which has no lambda is conformal with invariance. As you know, the coefficient is logarithmic. There is no scale there. OK? So, yeah. This, I think, in this explanation. Yeah. OK. Uh, well, actually, not completely. You know, suppose I use, <laughs> I use Laplacian. Then I can show you, actually, you don't get Weil squared. You get something else. So it's not only that, actually. There's some hidden, hidden aspect. Uh, Okay, you know, one really can say also things which are not perfect, and uh, the thing which is not, not perfect, actually, that here there is a prediction on the unification of the coupling, of gauge coupling, let me say. What is this? It is, tells me that 5 over 3 g1 squared is equal g2 squared equal g3 squared. 
And uh, if you run the RG equations and you look at, uh, if you define alpha i to be g i squared over 4 pi, i is 1, 2, 3, you find that, you know, alpha 1 inverse, alpha 2 inverse, and alpha 3 inverse, they almost meet, but not quite. Not Depends, actually. One, of course, has to run, if you do, to zeroth order, you know, just run, or first order, you know. If you run that, you discover they don't. But in reality, you really have to take loop corrections into account. Now, the loop corrections have been worked out even up to three loops, actually. Up to three loops, things have been worked out. And it's known, actually, that the running does change. And especially for the alpha 3 inverse, actually, it does change is uh, like 16% correction or something. <coughs> So, however, the problem is that nobody has worked out the equations in the presence of the singlet, because we know a singlet does change the Higgs, and the Higgs itself changes the other coupling. So, and uh, nobody has done actually even to two loops. Uh, they have done only to one loop. We know to one loop things do change, but still the thing don't really completely meet. We are not really sure actually of, of, the, of the story, because we are waiting until someday when somebody will compute the two loop order corrections, and uh, the, the guess is that things would really improve, actually. Uh, however, this is subject to discussion, actually, whether is there something beyond the standard model or not. This is a topic that I will discuss later, whether is there any physics beyond the standard model besides the fields that I have written. You know, because if you look at this point of view with this classification, it seems that we only predict the standard model plus the sigma field, which is new. Uh, later, actually, there is a dilaton, which I have not talked about yet. That's also a possibility. Uh, you can add, actually, an antisymmetric field, which is an action, by, through torsion terms, by assuming the connection, actually, in the uh, manifold part here. In the four-dimensional manifold part, you, you can assume that the connection has a completely antisymmetric torsion in which the B field would appear only through its field strength. This you can do. And uh, in this case, you'll obtain a very, uh, you'll, you'll obtain the usual action actually as a contribution. So that's a possibility. But uh, apart from this, this is it actually. Then you say, okay, there is nothing else. Um, so this actually is, but uh, you know, of course a, there is a question mark. We cannot really make a definite statement now. They don't meet, but you know, something may happen because nobody has computed the two loop uh, renormalization group equations. This will come at some point, I'm sure. Um, the next, of course, actually things, to, many things we, don't, we cannot explain, like uh, why there are three generations. We have, the structure of the Yukawa coupling, you know, this Dirac operator in the finite space has many entries, and every entry happens to be a Yukawa coupling for one of the observed fermions. So if one can predict, actually, the values of each, of course, you have solved the eternal problem in, but that, that seems to be really tough. And the question is, what determines the Yukawa couplings, actually? This we have not answered, actually. what determines or the entries, let me say, what determines the Dirac operator in the finite space completely? You know, this is a big question, but uh, if one can do that, you have really a full scale prediction of everything that is observed. Uh, the number of generations also. We have nothing to say about Anyway, if you want to multiply this by three generations, it means the algebra is the direct sum now. No, 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 the algebra doesn't change. Ah. The hyperspace changes. Okay. Just you repeat three times the hyperspace. But okay. I mean, it's important to say here, if you want that, okay, the difference with the usual problem for you kind of cutting is that now there is geometric meaning. And this means that if one could uh, make a guess of what is the corresponding geometric non-commutative space, then you could make a guess for the Yukawa coupling. So this is... This is a yeah, I think now the question, you know, the, the question of the Yukawa couplings of the Fermi has been changed into a geometric. a geometric question, is that what determines the Dirac operator of the finite space? We have not really assumed anything about this operator, and this is the reason why, you know... If let, let, me, let me make, for instance, you know, 
wrong guess, but just to give some idea, I mean, uh, uh, it's known, for instance, you know, that uh, if you look at spectra and so on, you will find that there is something which is corresponding to the usual music, and which which has no incarnation for ordinary spaces, but which for, if you think about non commutative space, you will obtain what is called a quantum sphere. Now, the quantum sphere has a spectrum which is powers of Q. And it's not difficult to see that when you look at the structure of the quark, and all that, there is a little bit of this geometric structure in the sense that the masses are, are, mm -hmm. are more like powers, like an, rather than an arithmetic progression. So what would, what one would need to do is a bright guess of what is you know, the underlying geometric space. Yeah. But I think you know, the, the point is made is that now the question of Yukawa coupling has been changed to a geometric question. What's the nature of the geometric space remains to be seen. Well, we need to have a, a huge basket of geometries, non commutative geometries, including uh, quantum spheres and everything, and look yeah. in this basket for what uh, would correspond to that. This is the idea. But, uh, you know, according to my information, there are some examples, but not that many, actually. Are there many examples? Well, yes, there are plenty of examples. The, the thing that you need to understand is what would make examples to be finite. Mm -hmm. you know, there are plenty of infinite examples, mm -hmm. I mean, with infinite spectrum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, of course, we know that it's, it's finite, finite yeah. space. Mm -hmm. So, finite space, you have to, to somehow, you know, cut this quantum sphere or something, do, do something like a full or something like that. Okay. Um, Dilaton. When I introduced a spectral action, I said that the spectral action is trace of f of d squared over lambda squared. And, you know, we put this by hand, this scale. However, you know, the idea of a scale which is inserted by hand, uh, not very natural. And then it's, it's more natural, actually, to say, I'm really going to, I can replace d squared by e minus phi, d squared e minus phi. Why, actually? Because here, if you let phi goes on to phi, say, plus lin lambda, it really gives me that d squared would go into d squared over lambda squared. OK? So let me call it this d phi. I define it this way. You know, it, it, uh, it gives you. So it's, it's natural to replace the scale. And you hope that the field phi is dynamical, and then it will get some expectation value, you know, since the only scale is. I just want to make one remark, you know, it's important this point because, well, imagine that f is just a cutoff function. Then when you take f of d square over lambda square, you look at the eigenvalues of d, which are smaller than lambda. That's the same thing. But now when you put the real term, what you do is you look at where it's smaller than exponential phi. So it's, it's no longer at the, Global, but it's localized somehow. So this is what it means. This, uh, this, uh, the other. Well, actually, see, in physics now is, is know that the best thing that if you really want a number, the best thing is to put uh, a field and let it get an expectation value, and this expectation value would really okay. So now the problem then reduces actually to this computation, trace of this d squared phi like that. And the question: What's the answer? So one does the calculation, and one discovers, actually, the following, that this becomes, you know, it's really easy to see here what happens is that if you have something like g mu, g mu, OK, so what's the leading operator, the leading term? The leading term would be e minus 2 phi g mu d nu plus. It's known, actually, that this elliptic operator starts with g mu nu d mu d nu. Now, you discover that there is e minus 2 phi. So you say, OK, let me define a new metric, which is e minus 2 phi g mu nu. And with this metric, actually, this would be equivalent to going to the Einstein frame. This gives me, so the big capital G, all this bad notation, actually, to write capital G, because in general relativity, capital G refers to the Einstein metric. But let me take Einstein frame. And then one observes the following that in this Einstein frame, in which the metric is this guy, in which it has been rescaled with the G, what happened is that the spectral action really becomes like this. This phi disappears. And then the next term will be root G, R of G. 
And then, for example, even for the mass term, you'll get actually, let me say, this is important, huh? you get h prime bar h with some mu squared or something. Well, actually, there's h bar prime h prime. And there's sigma and everything. And where we have defined h prime to be e minus phi h. And in addition, there is a term which is g mu nu d mu phi d nu phi. And then we go on, and then we get g with c mu nu rho squared, which is conformal invariant. In other words, actually, the action in terms of the new frame, which has been rescaled with the dilaton field, is exactly the same action as without, except for one term, one and only one term. And this term is the kinetic term for the dilaton. It gets a kinetic term, so this is really a physical field. In addition, you have, you know, everything is rescaled. For example, phi prime will become e minus 3 over 2 phi, h prime is e to the minus phi h, and so on. So in other words, the physical fields you observe have been really scaled with the dilaton. What is, now actually in reality, one really can go and compare this, the model you obtained with what was known as the Randall syndrome model. You really find exactly the same model. In that picture, what happens is that you go to a five-dimensional theory. In this five-dimensional theory, you have, in the fifth direction, you assume, first of all, actually, you assume that uh, you have periodic coordinates. And uh, so, well, actually, they actually assume that you have two brains. And this would correspond to the x5 is 0. This corresponds to the x5 is pi. And uh, what happens is that some fields get rescaled on one copy and not on the other. However, in our case, you know, it's a similar situation. The terms are identical, actually, except the fact now we know that h prime is e minus phi h. Perturbatively, you know, one really has to compute the action to all orders, which we cannot. And but it's really clear that at the perturbative level, the phi doesn't really get potential terms. The higher terms will be, will be um, derivative terms. And this uh, situation is very similar to what happened in string theory, in which the field phi doesn't really get, uh, the field phi doesn't get a potential. And um, uh, so one assumes that at the non-perturbative level, phi gets an ex uh, some expectation value. You had the scale, you had the scale somewhere. I mean, the Higgs potential of the scale minus mu squared. So, yeah. exponential minus. Here, yeah, well, actually. Well, actually, here, yeah, you know, there is a scale, okay, lambda squared, or it's really M Planck squared in all this. Okay. You are saying there is no dependence, algebraic dependence on phi, exponential phi, anywhere? Uh, no. There is only. There will, the mass square. Yeah. Mass square. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, the, uh, this is a kinetic term, but the mass, they, like the Higgs minus mu square um, h squared, because h they're is not scale. exponential minus 2 phi. Well, well, okay, it's let me, you know, you are here going to get through g, I don't know. In the Higgs potential, there was a scale. Yeah, then you're, okay. h is a scale, by, by the scale. h squared. But if, if it's like that, phi, uh, phi equal uh, 0 is a solution, you're saying. It's, it's really decoupled, then. Except from the kinetic term, yeah. Yeah, but it's decoupled. I mean, if I call constant, yeah, then this is an exact solution. It does not couple to physics. Uh, it doesn't couple to th except through derivative terms, yeah. So one has, one has to assume that, you know, at the non-perturbative level, it may get a potential. This is not, not easy to see, but uh, this is a possibility. No, but even if it does, this is an extra scalar field. It's not a dilaton anymore. Yeah. I mean, the uh, dilaton changes something. If here, it's, it's called a scalar. It's a, it's a scalar field, which is on the side. Well, yeah, exa you know, you will not see, but it, it has a consequence. For example, that if the field H... After rescaling, it disappears. So if uh, they, if the only term left is the kinetic yeah. term, it's called uh, sure. a master scalar field. So that's scalar. what we call conformal invariance. Uh, no, that's yeah. a separate thing, because it's not conformally called. But... It's not conformal, because this term destroys conformal invariance. I think the problem is that you know now you can it's a question of interpretation because now you can say actually the field h prime if the field h 
we get an expectation value. We have seen that. But now we have to look at the symmetry breaking with h prime now. We forget about h. If, you are, if what you are saying is correct, let me forget about the h and all that. And I have only I have 5 somewhere on the side, and then I have h prime. So h prime will get the value 1, let's say. Um, to find independent value, uh, value. Uh, but before the, va the the value of h prime was like a mu, yeah, you are not sure which was yeah. which was lambda, sure yes. and therefore as you have modified lambda by exponential five, sure, the sure. value of h prime the should be exponential five. Is correct. The square term cannot be correct. I mean, it, it's only the conformal piece which which is invariant, but not this term. Yes. So this term cannot be the same. Uh, yeah, yeah, this term cannot be the same because the volume rescales at the first power, this term rescales as, as a second power. So there is an exponential in front of this, uh, this column. Okay, then it is. A, yeah, the Dirac and the Sure, sure, sure. Then you see it. Yeah, and this term is not correct, really. Yeah, because I'm because the volume rescales at checking. the first power, not, not for this term. Yeah. It cannot be correct, this term. Yeah, I have to check it. Just a second. Yeah. One needs to see the ratio between no, the H4 because there is an H4. No, H4 is correct, but not this term. Mm -hmm. This term has, has to, to exist. As a scale, lambda square. Sure. Sure, sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah
the chirality operator. And in reality, you can put, you can compute this guy. And for trivial models, of course, you are really, good. if you do it, you know, naively, uh, you obtain terms like this. Mu nu rho sigma r mu nu a b r rho sigma a b. You get such terms. You get also terms like epsilon mu rho sigma, f mu nu rho sigma with a trace on the internal space. Okay? This is known, you know, for QCD, it gives you what's called the theta parameter. This will be present. You can compute and you'll get, okay? Um, so this is the Euler terms, actually, which destroy parity because it has only one epsilon. Uh, I think in generativity, what they call it, Barbero Immersi or something, terms. It has some name in generativity. Now, so if we do the calculation for the spectral action here, for this, what do you really get? This, is, as I said, is a huge trace where, you know, this is an arbitrary function, but the trace is 384 by 384 matrix. And you, in, in reality, you really obtain this term, but the term have a coefficient zero, you know? The three comes 24 minus 24 equal to zero. So for spectral action, this term is really absent this parity violating term. And in addition, for QCD, I don't know, let me call it V mu nu or G, I don't know, to call it V mu nu V rho sigma for SQ3 is also absent. It's also absent. It's not absent for everybody. For example, you get a term like epsilon mu nu rho sigma B mu nu B rho sigma, but this is a total derivative actually. Doesn't count. However, there is a term which did bother me actually at some point. And this has to do exactly the same as the theta term of QCD, but for the weak interaction. But then I went and I discovered that people actually, <laughs> this term is observed actually, and it's taken into account. You see? It's not that it's not present, it is present and is, is there actually. It's a parity violating term for the SU2 because there's no the SU2 does actually break parity. But you know, I need the right combination, it would be trace of 1 plus gamma over 2 times F. Of well, actually, I'm really general. I take this and I take that. This we have already computed. I add, this actually is not parity violating, this term is parity violating. This term is an index formula. Then. Yeah. So if you compute, you find actually that in reality, it's Euler term, but it's absent. And uh, similarly... It's absent because of uh, some anomaly cancellation. It's, yeah, it's, some, some it's in numerics, actually. And everything is rigged so that... There are sectors that are on left, right, even. Exactly. I think this is, this is the good answer, you know. <laughs> this is the good answer. It's left-right symmetry. Make sure that this term is not there, actually. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, however, actually, of course, at the tree level, we have the theta at the tree is zero, yeah? But uh, is, is, uh, is, not, uh, is not enough to, to guarantee it is also true at the loop, actually. At the, at the loop, at the, uh, uh, okay, one can show that, actually, uh, at one loop, you have to make an arrangement to cancel. But if you m manage to arrange it to cancel at one loop, it will cancel to all orders. However, there is an, you know, a condition which we don't know what it means here, is that the determinant of the up and the down quark coupling should be real. If you can arrange that, one can show then that the theta would be absent to all loop orders. This is the condition that it, it, it's eliminated at one loop order, but if you arrange that, it will be eliminated at all loop orders, actually. So I, again, this is a question which is related to the structure of the Dirac operator in the finite space. Why should this condition should be there? But at least, actually, at the tree level, is is not there. And uh, there's no fine tuning. It's natural and it's automatic. So I think, you know, that's uh, one of the positive things from the... Next. Any questions before I move on? Yeah, I just want to say one thing about this, this um, 
you know, when you say the connection not to be symmetric, when you have this anti-symmetric terms, because, I mean, of course, it's very important that one characterizes abstractly the Dirac operator. So, and this appears. This, uh, yeah, you know, usually you have to make sure that psi d psi, well, there is a j, but okay, you know. Uh, maybe the, let me say d psi psi. I can do it this way. It has to be Hermitian. And this hermeticity, it means you really have to integrate by parts. Integrating by parts, there's certain, pro, you know, there's in, in uh, generativity, it means it's a condition on the spin connection. And this condition on the spin connection, it's really, I think you can call it like this, omega mu mu b is equal to zero. You know, it means the trace of the connection should be equal to zero. And this, of course, is satisfied by connections where the torsion is completely anti-symmetric. But uh, what I would say is, is not this, you know, what I would say is that if you, if you want to characterize algebraically the Dirac operator on the manifold, okay, the condition that you obtain very naturally from the computative geometry, they still have a little bit of freedom and it corresponds to this freedom. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, this, uh, this field might be interesting to investigate. Of course, we don't really look at it. Yeah, the action it is mostly relevant to dark matter, and, you know, CP violation and things like that, you know. Is, uh, okay, next. The question that is there anything? Beyond the standard model. In other words, you know. It's now known that experimentalists are looking for new physics, mostly in the form of supersymmetry, but in the form of anything, actually. The, everything is open for possibilities. And it's a relevant question, is that anything beyond, is there anything, any physics beyond the standard model? We have seen that in our case, these are the only possibilities, and they have, you know, an, uh, Consequences are something at 10 to the 11 GeV with the sigma and with the neutrino masses and things like that. But uh, the question, is there anything observable at low energy? Uh, in other words, you know, if uh, tomorrow some at CERN they announce that they discovered in the data new si signals, what would it correspond to? And, uh, so the question for us is that is there any room for generalization? You know, are we, have we been exhaustive in our analysis? Well, there is a weak point, obviously, in our analysis, which is the, 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 the breaking from HR position. Yeah. So obviously, we remember that at one point, we said there is a non-trivial mixing, and you know the sigma does exist, and this broke into C plus H left plus M3 of C. And this we, uh, you know, we did it by assuming that this condition holds. Now, I mentioned before that this condition does imply that the connection is linear. What does it mean, actually? It means if I define dA, which is d plus A plus epsilon JA, G inverse, then uh, you know that under, so for example, uh, if you let psi go, I don't know, you psi, you opposite, then d a would go into, well, at least in this case, it would be u d a u star. where u is an element of A. And u is unitary. Provided, you know, this transformation is OK, provided this condition is satisfied. Do you have to psi on both sides? Or? Right, no, because this yeah, is you have to be no, careful. Or it's but not u, d, a, u star. Side. It's u, j, u, j star. The u. u no, the, the line the, above. The square, yeah. It's not U, D, A, U star. It's U, J, U star. Here. Yeah. 
No, no. Psi is, psi is u, psi u star, yes. And the action on the right is given by j. U psi, ah, u star, okay. Which is u psi, okay, here actually. We have to take, actually, it comes to the right as j. U j. Mm -hmm. j u j times psi. It's u j u j times j u j times psi. Okay. okay. The j makes a bimodule. So this actually, let me note as u u hat into psi, where we define u hat to be j u star j. I don't know if you write it like this. Put g u j. U j. This so you know, what, what, is, this is quite an important point because what happens is that because of the J, the hyperspace is a bimodule and the fermions are in the adjoint of an operation. This is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Moreover, uh, when you write DA, it's not U DA U star, it's U U at times DA times U U star U. Now we can see actually that in this case, actually, in reality, if we want to define the A, one has to define the A as something like A A hat. And what you have written in the, in the back is not correct. It's u, u hat. The a goes to u, u hat. Capital U. No. U, u hat? No, no. I, I mean, the, it's not the u in the algebra that you are there. It's u, u, u hat. Okay. The next transformation, you have two u's. And, uh, oh. But I don't try to have the A transform section. I want to have DA for this piece. Yeah, but DA is not U, D, U star. It's U, U at, D, U star. Mm -hmm. U, 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 Yeah, U, U hat. Yeah. Well, yeah. So essentially, if I define U to be U, U, huh? Then DA would go into U, DA, U star. Uh, well, actually, you know, remember I was talking about the case where I didn't assume this condition. This is <laughs> the thing that if you assume this condition, then of course this reverts to the other because all the hats would drop out. No, they don't drop out. No, they don't drop out. They add a new term, but they don't drop out at all. Uh, let me see. I thought actually that we have A. One second, A1 here. But you know, I thought that A1, if you assume this condition, would go into U, A1 U star. Ah, but plus the other term, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, so it's 3D. And it's similarly for the, for the other terms, okay. So, uh, in other words, actually, in reality, one has to in introduce such transformations and see what is the invariant uh, operator or what's the invariant uh, quantity you can produce. And uh, in this respect, let's see. So one discover actually that uh, the A has to be written as something like A i A G hat into D B i B G hat. You know, there is a tensor operator between them, but uh, I will not write tensor operators, obviously. Uh, so here we can make without any loss in generality. The summation of A i B i is one. Why? Because you can always increase your set by one, in which whatever you have, you add one more element, and so that this is satisfied. And here, summation on i and j. Now, remember actually, A i B j hat is equal to zero. This was the zero order condition, or order zero condition. which implies that left and right actions commute with each other. Now, if we try to compute this, op this object, we discover the following, that you have AI, AJ hat. And then I'm going to get D, B, I, B, G hat, plus 
FBI DB Hat. Summation on INJ. Uh, let me look at the last term first. So the last, uh, the second term can be written as AI summation I on J. AJ DBG at. Why? Because this, the BI and the AJ hat is zero. It goes through, it commutes. Okay? And of course, actually, this term, because AI BI is one, this term become AJ hat DBG. So obviously, I obtain my next term, which is this guy. Okay? Now, what about the first term? The first term, this one, I have to commute, actually, this guy with this guy. So obviously, I get the term, which is AJ hat DBI into BJ hat, plus another term, which is AI DBI AJ BJ. But this is one summation of the J. And this, of course, is the A, one. Now we call it one. But we are left with this term. Now this term, remember, we did assume the order one condition, which tells me that the A hat commutes with the DB. And this term drops out. Now, suppose that I don't assume this. What does it mean? It means that the A connection will have a new term. And this new term can be written as, you know, because this commutes with this in reality, I can take it in. And this term is nothing but it can be written as, it can be written as uh, commutator of A1 with, uh, sorry, AG. Yeah, it can be written as, let me write it. It can be written as AG hat A1. Note that it, it depends on bimodule terms. In other words, it depends on elements in the A and elements in the A opposite. And it's mixed term. That's why it's three really quadratic in the dependence. It depends on A and A, D, B, but from the other side. So these are quadratic terms. But once we admit actually that this term is there, we introduce this connection, then in reality, you can have more general connections than the one we considered. And these connections uh, <coughs> would have certain properties. So this is the most general connection you can consider without assuming the order one condition. I think it's very important to say two things here, uh -huh. because uh, I mean, at the conceptual level, it's, it's extremely important. So the first thing that we discovered is that when you drop this order one condition, which was making things very simple, you find out that the inner fluctuation of the metric and the, this uh, added connection, they form a semi group. And uh, how did we find that? We found that because you, know, you have this quadratic term, so you can get very scared. And then you, you can say, OK, imagine that I do an inner fluctuation. I get this new Dirac operator. Now imagine I start from this new Dirac operator, and I do again an inner fluctuation. I should get a quartic term because I, I got this quadratic term. No, there are cancellations, you still get a quadratic term. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean? It means that, in fact, underlying this whole story, there is a semi-group. And this semi-group only depends on the algebra, and it's an extension of the gauge group. And it governs all the inner fluctuations. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a big change with respect to the ordinary picture. What it means is that the inner fluctuations are, in fact, the action of the semi-group. And when you perturb by an element of the semi group, perturb again, you compose the elements of the semi group. So this is what Anna is trying to say. That these inner fluctuations that we considered with the element U, capital, and that they form a semi group. And the, what does mean that if you fluctuate with respect to the new generated inner fluctuations, you fluctuate again, it still gives you terms of the same form. So inner fluctuations are still again inner fluctuations 
which had the semi-group structure. And Pascal describes the semi-group, so the semi-group is simply, you take elements of the algebra which satisfy sigma of a i b i is equal to 1, and you compose them uh, by uh, left and right multiplication, and they still satisfy the same thing. We call it the semi-group of perturbations. Okay. So this is the property opposite summation on J, which is an element of A across A opposite, and such that AJBJ is one. Okay, as I said, it's not really strong condition because you can always make it, and such that AJ bj opposite is equal it's the star of itself you know it's bg star aj opposite star i'm not writing tensor products there are tensor products actually here so the definition of the summary group Anyway, now I'm not going to because the, the computation are quite important. From space-time point of view, this new term in the connection, E2, what does it look like? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to. <coughs> I'm going to. I'm going to present it now. Yeah. It's only if the Dirac operator was not first order. <coughs> but for instance, the reason why we are also very interested for ordinary space-time is that we know that the Dirac propagator is dressed by the quantum corrections. So this means that the true Dirac operator will not be order one. <coughs> because it will have a, 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 a form factor. And then it does not satisfy the order one condition, so this perturbation will be necessary for this case, even for the ordinary case, because of the quantum corrections. So let me try to answer to you a question. What happens, actually, if we allow for this case? Practically, how the things would look like? And uh, So now, no more breaking, because this, uh, there is no order one condition to break this. This has to come dynamically, in other words. The breaking must be attained dynamically. And you simply say, OK, now let me compute the Dirac operator. And you discover that, how the, the Dirac operator looks like. First of all, you have h right, h left. It would imply that your gauge groups is SU2 right and SU2 left. And in the bottom, you have SU4 color, actually. So the diagonal elements in this uh, will be right, left, and color. So obviously, you know that the gauge group in this case is SU2 right cross SU2 left cross SU4 color. The dimension of the Hilbert space is still 16. So the prediction doesn't change. But now your 16 is written as 2 right plus 2 left and a 4. So 4 times 4 is 16, and this is the way it's decomposed. And of course, this is known as the Patti Salam model, in which it has lepton comes out as the fourth color. OK, now. What about actually how the, the Dirac operator looks? We know we have learned actually that whatever happens in the off diagonal elements would be Higgs fields. So you are really going to get new Higgs fields. And uh, the new Higgs fields would look like as follows. You know, let me give you uh, an example. So this would be, uh, let me say, phi. I call it, I call it sigma a dot b, sigma a dot b, and yeah, it's phi a dot b, something like this. So it's two right, two left. So you really get this type of new Higgs fields. And uh, along the off diagonal elements, you are going to get, I don't know, sigma a dot i b j. So you really get higher representations with respect to the SU2 right cross SU2 left cross SU, uh, cross SU4. So you get the new Higgs fields. So there is no more uh, uh, one doublet. So you have, which is necessary because in the end, you need more Higgs fields to break this symmetry into the lower symmetries. 
Uh, now, you know, there are technical details because if you really start from Dirac operators that satisfy the order one condition because of the semi-group structure, you would obtain, you would obtain actually a new phenomena where the Higgs fields and this are composite of his fields that appear here. So you don't really get independent fields. You get the, you know, fields that depend on only a very small set of Higgs fields, which is the two right, two left. And you get another one, which is delta A dot I. This is uh, two right, two left. And this is two right and a four. And um, yeah, so now actually you may ask, <laughs> what is this old sigma? So if you look, the question which configuration would generate for me the standard model as in its set, and it is the following. Yeah, it is this one. So. A dot i, if we take it to be, you know, if we take this index to be one, one of them, it means if, okay, this is the expectation value. And if you take delta i to be one, it means the lepton color would get a VEV. And it's root sigma. Then that, and similarly, actually, this guy, you take it phi a dot b. You take it to be delta A dot 1, epsilon B, C, H, C, like that. Then you can show <coughs> everything reduces to standard model. So you can obtain the standard model as one of the vacuum expectations of the full theory. But of course, actually, there are many vacua. The question is which vacua to, to consider. Uh, depend, uh, you see, of course, I, I, can, I can say the following, that the Higgs structure is completely fixed. It's not that I, unlike gauge theories. In gauge theories, actually, what killed grand unified theories, like SU5, is the following. In grand unified theories, first of all, the Higgs sector is completely arbitrary. first. And the second, you have the proton decay problem. Yes? I mean, once you have Higgs in some of the presentation, you have uh, two or three scalars invariants, so you start completely arbitrary. Yeah. Well, the, look, I, I give you how arbitrary. No, look, let me take, say, the SO10 model, yeah? Then what are the possible Higgs? You can have 45. You can have 210, you can have 120, you can have 126, and all these actually you can put in. And if you look at the potential, you will discover that you know, it, will it can have, in principle, 20 times or so, all with arbitrary coefficients. So group theory cannot help you in this respect because there are many possibilities. Once you start taking product representations, then many things are possible. And in reality, the group is SU4. Uh, not, I, you know, I was given an example of the SO10 a grand unified group Y, actually, in the end, things really become very complicated for grand unified theories because one can say, okay, you, why don't you consider SO10? Because an SO10 is like us. The fermions all live in the 16-dimensional representation. However, there it's not the only representation allowed. You can have, actually, many other representations, you know, like, uh, as I say, the, this 126 is a spinner representation. So you can have the 126 spinner representation. For us, it is the only representation allowed. 16 is the only thing which you can have. In addition, when you compute the spectral action, all the Higgs interaction are fixed. You know, you compute, you get an answer, and it's the end of the story. There is no room for maneuver. Uh, the nature of the Higgs fields, it's more actually that we really find two cases, let me say. The two cases. One case in which you start from a D, which does not satisfy order one condition. An arbitrary, you know, the thing that before you fluctuate, you allow a D which, is, which looks random. Then in this case, you are really going to genera uh, generate uh, Higgs fields 
which are listed, which you can list actually. Yeah, I can I can write them. Uh, it's what two right, two left, and fifteen, and you know. So uh, I write them. Uh, yeah, I written them actually. Two right, two left. 1 plus 15, 3 right, 1 left, 10, 1 right, 1 left, 6, and so on. So this actually you can have. Or if you start from a D that does satisfy the order 1 condition, because of the semi-group structure, you will go there and you will stay there. You cannot get out. And in that case, the Higgs fields that you can have is only this, these two guys that I have written here. Actually which happens to be 2 right, 2 left, and this happens to be 2 right, 4. These are the only Higgs fields you can have, and then this potential does become simplified. Uh, the problem actually in this case, of course, is that the connection becomes quadratic in these fields. Quadratic in these fields, then you have to, un you know, one has to understand the phenomena, whether this semi-group structure would help you with the normalization scheme or not. This we have not investigated, we don't know the answer. It may help or it may not help. But the worst possible case is that you can have all of this. Now, all of this can have this break-in mechanism. And in this break-in mechanism, you would recover the standard model. And in this case, if you ask me, you know, what would happen if this was the case? Then, of course, you are really going to generate this SU2 SU right, for example. And the SU2 right has extra gauge fields. And this extra gauge fields, of course, it depends which scale you are going to do the breaking. If you do the breaking at the intermediate scale or you do the scaling at the unification scale, you are really going to get different physics. So it's too early to tell, actually. There could be consequences in which one really can go beyond the standard model. And this thing would have consequences. But this thing has to be studied seriously. And we have not studied this thing seriously because Nothing has been observed yet. We are not really going to jump and say, OK, because as we say, the possibilities are many, are plenty. Uh, the model is fixed. Uh, the model is fixed. So in principle, you know, with uh, enough expertise, one can analyze this model. Uh, one thing about the proton decay problem is no one actually that the SU2, the patty model, or SU2 right cross SU2 left cross SU4 does not have the proton decay problem. Proton does not decay in this. Uh, in this, uh, with this symmetry. So you avoid it. And in reality, actually, what really killed the SU5 model and the SO10 bosonic model, not the supersymmetric one. Supersymmetric one is not dead, actually. And the reason is that the unification scale in supersymmetry is raised to, to 10 to 16 GeV. And there are some cancellations. So uh, there is proton decay, which is invisible. Uh, you know, you cannot, you cannot see it you need at least four orders of magnitude in order to, to become observable. So supersymmetric unification models are still OK. Uh, but here, we don't have actually the problem. So this problem also is bosonic, but it has no problem of proton decay. It has the advantages of unification. It can give you physics beyond the standard model. But the physics beyond the standard model is somewhere you know, at unification scale, which is something like 10 to 16 GeV. And uh, it could be even higher, actually, the symmetry, depending on where the coupling constants meet and uh, whether you want to say the gravity. Uh, because, you know, the, the three orders of magnitude, it depends uh, on, on, on there are some numbers that come in uh, which unify, uni, unifies gravity with other three interactions. and. Uh, uh, it is possible that uh, gravity does unify, you know, all the gravity is at the Planck. It does unify with the, with the sense 16 because you have relations with numbers coming in. And it's easy to, you know, explain a thousand with all the numbers coming in. So the conclusion is the following, is that if we allow the most general possibility in which we drop one of the conditions on the non-commutative geometric properties, which is what we call the order one condition. Order one condition means you, uh, uh, connections are not linear. They could be quadratic. They could have quadratic dependence. Uh, 
then you can go to the patisella model but again this is unique you really can do nothing else apart from that another issue which i did not discuss is that what happened if you go and consider you know we stopped at the first case where the dimension of the hilbert space is 16 but we know that the next dimension of the hilbert space this was four four, four squared the next dimension will be six squared or eight squared depending actually whether we want to consider uh, let me see, you have to take uh, M6 of C, and maybe you have to take M3 of H or something. But if we insist that this to be even again, this would really take us into M4 of H plus M8 of C. This, it means you really have 64 fermions. It means you'll have a new fermions, you know, it's, uh, it's too big. It's too big, except actually some people are saying, okay, maybe, you know, this is, uh, but I'm not, I'm not really going to go into really something very speculative. Is the, remember, we always write, you know, we, we took the product of space time times, uh, so there is a spinner index. And then you say, okay, maybe this uh, M4 of H has also uh, the Lorentz group inside. You know, one, one can say such things, but one has to prove it and that it's a realistic picture. Uh, some people did assume that, like Litzy and company, but it's uh, suspect, I would say. It's a suspect. They have not shown that it works. And uh, so there are possibilities, but it's, it really would need too many new fermions. You know, and until they find something, I don't think it's, uh, it's worth venturing into... In fact, you know, the prediction we have for the top mass would, would, uh, would change. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, this, I, I don't believe this. I mean, I yeah. Remember, actually, you know, this, yeah, something which probably I, I said, I said it in words, but I didn't say, is that we have this relation, this would never change, is that the summation of the square of the weighted, I would say, m squared, you know, in this case, e plus m squared in u plus whatever. Yeah, but there's weights actually with colors, you know. This will always be there. It's independent of what you do actually. It has to do with the scaling of the Higgs field. Once you scale the Higgs field to have canonical kinetic energy, then you are stuck with this relation. So, you know, obviously it's not really possible to go way beyond what we have. And it seems that the picture is extremely tight, I would say. It's extremely tight. Um, you know, my time is up. I will stop here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to.